Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me today. My name is Paul Groom, Chief Innovation Officer at Cognitio, and I'd like to spend the next 40 minutes uh, hopefully educating you, a little bit of entertainment as well. Try not to make these sessions too dry, try and make a little bit more fun and interesting for you, and lead you on through a little bit of discovery. And the topic on the screen there I think is pretty clear. The Industry has, with so-called NoSQL, tried to wash away probably one of the most pervasive languages present in the computer industry. And this language is rooted in many different applications, many different platforms, servers, and services. And I think the industry has pushed back quite clearly in terms of its uh, credentials and position. The other thing I want to establish today is in memory, RAM. Now, it's an interesting thing when you spend time with the children around a presentation. I mean, do any of you do that? You sit there with the PowerPoint, the kids look over your shoulder, and you say, I'm really looking for a big picture of RAM. Oh, OK. That's what I was given. Little miss on, you know, slight misunderstanding there in terms of what I was trying to achieve. Having said that, having looked at this picture, I quite like it because it's got the right sort of mood and attitude. Remember, we're talking about an industry today where people debate the color of their elephant. Is it a yellow elephant, a green elephant? So I take the view on RAM. So use this as, a, as an icon to create a, pos a position for you. The reality is, is this is the stuff I'm talking about, DRAM, true in-memory processing. And again, for the principle of analytics. So let's cover off some positions. If any of you have this as your data collection proposition, rather than this as your data collection proposition, it's probably time to head out of the room because what we're talking about is the incessant flow of big data. And notice what I'm showing you here is a flow of data. We hear in this industry various conversations about lakes and whatever, but it's that incessant flow, and it's the need to dip into that flow, assess that flow, derive value from that flow, that I think many of you are in the room here today, and certainly at this conference, uh, in terms of understanding value. Now, the reality of what you're already delivering is you know, classic reporting. Now, that reporting, traditional business intelligence, has had a series of queries that seem to get ever more complex, ever larger in volume, uh, ever more scary as people start to show you what's going on behind the scenes when you say, but I only wanted that in a second. And they start to try and explain to you and pat you on the head and sort of say, well, hang on a minute, it was a little bit more demanding than that. The reality is that the industry as a whole is trying very hard to push into the world of analytics. Now, analytics in the past was a project activity. You would commission a team of people. You would gather some data. You would allocate some time and a project manager with some deliverables planned. And you'd probably run it over a three-month, maybe six-month period. Sorry, guys. We're in the web 2.0 and above businesses now. This stuff has to happen in the order of minutes, certainly no more than hours. And therefore, the shelf life of data becomes vital. And the kind of activity that you're going to complete on that data the kind of analyses and processes you're going to apply to that data have to become ever more sophisticated, ever more computationally intense than anything than just simple select count from where that was previously going through your traditional BI and database environments. So as you head up that continuum, the ability to do machine learning, dynamic simulation on the fly as the data gets passed through to a report or to a decision process is going to become the norm. So we have a community of users making use of this capability. Reasonable, fair reflection. Problem is that's quite a small community. So if, if that's the number of people you're trying to serve, again, you probably don't need to be in this room because you've, you've probably got technologies that can cope with this. The reality for some of you is probably closer to this. A large number of people with that expectant gaze, I think in this case, actually, this was a horse race, and they're watching for the horses to cross the finish line. But that's probably like business anyway. Everyone's waiting to see how things you know, are going to cross the finish line. I think a few of you are in younger businesses. 
where this is probably your user crowd, a little bit more lively, a little bit more pent up, and probably considerably more demanding. Demanding in what way? Well, I could argue in this way. The younger generation have been bred on this amazingly small user interface. Single box with that expen ex expectant little bar waiting for you to enter something into it. But you, with you knowing that you're guaranteed that within second or two, there's going to be a massive information flow from that. It's fascinating if you engage with the younger generation how they just treat this as normal. For the people in this room, like myself, a little bit of gray hair, a little bit of you know, track record delivering this stuff, we tend to think about what might be going on behind the scenes there and maybe start to inhibit the way we treat it and think about it. But hey, we can use this as well and we experience the same performance and benefits around this. And it brings us back to this device, the clock. I wonder how many of you in this room operate without this thing incessantly ticking, demanding of you to do something quicker now, in lower time frames, shorter latencies. If there isn't a time pressure, probably time to head out to the back of the room and drift on out to one of the other sessions. Because all of the points I've shown you there are establishing some of the pressures that drive analytics, business intelligence, and processing to be ever faster, ever higher throughput, with lower latencies, and with considerably higher expectations that ever existed before. Now, as we've seen in this event, the industry as a whole tends to go through cycles. We have the innovation, the consolidation. Does anybody disagree that we're in the innovation phase at the moment? Because if any of you have walked the floor out there today with all of the different vendors, all of us out there offering new propositions, capabilities, this is probably the most fertile technological part of the industry probably for the last well, probably more decades than I care to mention. I was talking to a group of uh, associates at lunch, and we identified that there's probably more venture capital money in this business today funding potential than probably at any other time. So you're in the innovation hotspot. And what does innovation bring? Well, bring some change and adaptations. By the way, in Europe, we're not allowed to use those old light bulbs anymore. Law dictates we have to use these things. These are the new generation innovative light bulbs. Come on. Anybody want to try the joke? How many Hadoop programmers does it take to change a light bulb? None. We implemented 3N redundancy, so two light bulbs are still working. And hey, I can provision you some more ceiling tomorrow with ever more light bulbs if it's not light enough for you. OK, it was a try. But remember, it's cyclic. Consolidation will eventually come through, and we'll see how that uh, might affect us in the future. So let's do a reflection from some of the people in the room here. Here's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. CIO, maybe one of the new roles, CDO, Chief Data Officer. Could be CTO, maybe. What have you got to do? Well, Jeff has to serve the business. He has to innovate, he has to steer, direct, learn, understand. I'm sure many of you are here at this conference today to try and understand what you might do, how you might do it, and probably when you can do it. And I expect there's a few people out there wondering you know, at what budget levels and time frames, but you have that uh, rod on your back. But of course, we have to remember that Jeff's got this guy, the robot, the suit. Because remember, in this industry, you keep hearing about the hoodies and the suits. The hoodies are the technicians. They're the ones that are doing all the clever work around Hadoop and all the infrastructure around this and all of the corollary systems that sit upon it. We have the suits, the people that actually want something from this. They want to change the business. They want to improve revenue, change revenue, drive cost savings. So what we tend to get is, Jeff, I need. But of course, poor old Jeff there, he's got to deliver. He's got to work the data. He's got to come up with solutions to this. So on an established basis, he's got a range of tools. 
Here's a common thread to all of these tools. SQL, SQL. And notice here that I'm showing you the sort of the modern generation of tools. I've, I've left some of the older generation tools, the business objects, my strategies, cognosis to one side. They're very well established, pervasive almost in the businesses. But this is where the innovation and drive is coming. I've also deliberately left off some of the newer Hadoop-only tools. I mean, some of you are in the room for the previous session. That there are some new players, but they're very polarized. They're very focused. The business has established requirements. They've already invested. You've probably already spent the dollars of the business doing this work and deploying infrastructure. Now you've got to try and glue some things together. How can I glue all of this and the benefits of it to this new generation of Hadoop and the infrastructure around it and the big data? That's quite a challenge. And we'll, we'll look through some of this. So the business desire, put in square brackets, the business intelligence desire. Well, common theme here. What are the things they're looking for? Oops, yep. Not too many users, please, because you know, users are hard work. You know, that puts a challenge on the system. So interactions, let, let them do more. Let, let them click the button a few more times. But this is the goals. Again, time. Notice time at the top. First two items are effectively time bound. Get the data in quicker. Do things faster. Deliver, deliver. Enrich. Bring more data together. Build logical data warehouses. Build new models of information and allow that discovery to occur. Granularity, give me more history, give me more detail, give me the transactions, but let me dig on in. And ultimately, I want to do some of this for myself. Remember, those previous tools are very good for self-service engagement. It allows the user to directly interact with the data themselves and have their own thoughts and determination. Problem is, that puts a lot of ad hoc pressure on the underlying infrastructure. Remember, those demanding users, remember that youthful crowd I showed you. They eagerly want to engage with this. And of course, Along comes our little yellow elephant. A whole disruptive force. And I've spoken before at various sessions, as have others, around what this has brought to the industry. And I'll let you make your own choices around this. But the, the point it must bring you to is, this is a question you must ask yourself as you start to construct your shiny new Hadoop infrastructure. What do you doing for your business with this? How much data of value is in there? Can you get to that value? Can you serve that robotic boss who just wants from you? And how will you improve the access to that? Because I imagine for a lot of you, that is the challenge that you've come to this conference with, and probably why some of you sit in this room just for some guidance around this. And the key here is around the word pertinent. Interesting list of similes here, oh, sorry, synonyms here. Uh, around this. I quite like the idea, on target, on the button, on the nose, that kind of quaint. Applicable. How much, the, how much of the data that you're bringing in is applicable to your needs? How do you even know it's applicable? Have you even tested that it's applicable and pertinent? Now there is some commentary in the industry, and an interesting expression came up, are you just her dumping? I resisted the urge to play with that as a, as a motif and cartoon, but uh, I thought this was a safer one. But this isn't my invention. Here, here's some Twitter that was going on not too long back. Uh, Merv Adrian, I think many of you will know Merv. I hope he's feeling better. I've been watching his uh, slings and arrows with his uh, recent flu, but I uh, hope he's getting better. But his interesting comment there around fast food, well balanced, but it's all about planning. So if you don't track these, some of these guys, they're out there you know, making some of these comments, but it is a valid point. Hadoop can capture any amount of data and information. It's expansive, it'll grow, it's flexible, no doubts whatsoever. But are you just collecting a dump of information? So we come into some of the, the newer terms. You know, in the bottom corner here, I have poor old elephant under the load of data. The good news is, is like all living elephants, they're incredibly powerful. So Hadoop will carry that data. He will carry that burden reliably and on a forward basis. Many aspire to the data lake. Collection of information, but remember earlier I showed you about the flow of data. Remember, lakes are fed with flows. So that may look quite placid at the moment, and it's ever-growing. And you see those ripples? 
That's some of you dipping your toe in the water. You haven't even found out how deep it is yet. How are you going to find out how deep it is and what's down there? Loch Ness Monster, a little bit of fish, or is it just an inch deep? The only way you can do that is by wading into there and getting at the data and doing the work. So you're going to have to engage. Engage requires process, planning, activity. Now here's a challenging statement, tipping the apple cart a little bit here. But Hadoop itself is not suited to BI workloads currently. The engineers are working on it. 2.0, Yarn, etc. is definitely improving things. But you try hooking a traditional business intelligence tool or one of the more sophisticated data discovery tools, and you'll find the reality that even today, you cannot have a fully interactive, point and click, ad hoc usage by large numbers of users on a day in, day out basis. And remember this old expression from the BI world, train of thought. It's the ability to engage with data and ripple through it, make changes, determinations, adjust your studies. You might end up in a dead end, you back out, you head off in a different direction. Hadoop allows you to do batch operations, it allows you to, to wade into the water, but it doesn't give you the finesse. It doesn't give you the ability to be very adaptive and agile as you do your discovery and analytics. So if we do a little scorecard on this, it brings us to the point I can say, it certainly collects data, but your, the timeliness here is your ability to get in and engage with it fluidly. And then the data's there, you can trigger operations, you can use some of the new specialized tools and immediately start wading around, but I would say it doesn't serve the traditional BI community particularly well, the, the classic SQL community. Latency, well, that's being addressed to some degree, but it's still not you know, what the Google generation expect, that one to two second response. How many of you here have OLAP users? I mean, they're used to literally one second, sub-second responses on any interaction. The limits for them, however, is the amount of data they're engaging with and the dimensionality that they've put into the model. We've definitely got the richer model. We've definitely got the granularity. Absolutely perfect, brilliant, bring it on. More interactions? Well, no, I don't think you're going to put 100 BI users onto your Hadoop cluster just at this moment in time. And self-service? No, I still think there's a bit too much engineering that has to be done. The programmers still probably have to get involved. There are some tools that certainly help and improve this. And now we come on to the new world. Remember, we're in innovation. The innovation continues apace. We have the data scientists. A lo lovely new expression, which basically means a 50% boost in your salary, if not more, and probably more if you're on the West Coast. But what we're saying here is people who understand the analysis of information. Notice I didn't say data. It's the analysis for information. It's understanding that all that data and structure and the interrelations of it can lead to information and its value within the business. And so these people have to be served. Well. They're doing it through a lot of computation. Remember, I described earlier on that line going into much more complex processes and discovery where this isn't just process or batch oriented, it's now online, dynamic, and live. R, not deeply mentioned here at this event, but that's a changing force in the industry. Just like Hadoop, open source, ultra low cost, very broad, very well community supported. You can deploy this in a range of different ways to a lot of different value. Of course, the reality is, is now we start to look at the pipeline of activity. So in the past, each of these tasks were relatively small, and the engines lined up to cope with that steady staccato of activity coming through. But of course, the reality now is getting a bit more lumpy. Remember, those ad hoc users aren't just doing simple requests anymore. They're doing much more complex requests. But some of the bottlenecks haven't exactly gone away those things start to choke. So let's come back to Jeff as he ponders, as he stares off down there into the, uh, to the floor as he's working out how to crack this. Yeah. This is the sort of thing, the sort of notes he's writing to himself. I need to find a way to get more out of it. There's potentially you know, value there. But how is he going to get to it? How is he going to drive that through? Ultimately, he wants to use the existing infrastructure. 
Again, I was in, engaged with some colleagues in, in a lunch discussion today around the SQL integration. And the debate is, is, is this still important to the business? The fact that I've got a room full of people here suggests to me that, yes, this is still very important to the business because of your investments in those tools and applications. Whether you've bought them or whether you've built them yourself, you're used to having standard interfaces, standard languages, and the ability to do plug and play. That's not an expression we hear too often these days, but I still think very relevant. So if we look at SQL support, there are a range of SQL on Hadoop providers that you will have seen at the conference but it's all about degrees of. Many are starting with the basics. You know, that these are the ANSI standards around SQL. They offer the 8992 support. Well, that's fairly entry level, guys. Um, there's a, quite a few more steps on the standard. The, what was the 2012 draft has actually taken a step back and is now the 2011 fixed standard. So if people are only supporting, say, ANSI 92, They've still got a long way to go in terms of sophistication. And remember, a lot of these tools and applications use that sophistication in the SQL language. So if you're only offering at the early stages of the SQL support, you're going to inherently limit what some of the tools. You're almost taking a full step backwards in terms of the analytical sophistication that you're going to operate with. And let's not forget, it's about ad hoc usage. This isn't about batch usage. This is about people sat at terminals, sat at applications, clicking that relentless staccato of, I need results, and I want them quickly. And that brings us to degrees of performance. Anybody know what the lumpy bit of technology is there? Juno? That is technically now the fastest man-made object we have ever created. NASA slung shot around the Earth recently to send it on its way to Jupiter. 25 miles per second, apparently. I don't know if anybody was there with a radar gun to check it, but that's what they've sent it out at. So between these two extremes, there's a performance profile that you want. I'd imagine that you want to be closer to the Juno end rather than to our little slimy friend there off to one side. Of course, your business has all of this glowing technology buried away. Hopefully you've built computer farms, you've built ad adaptable. If not, you can go out into cloud services or various providers to do this. I think this is one of the Google data centers, all pristine and shiny. I'm curious as to what you think about when you see this in terms of your needs. If you sort of dream through this, is this what you're thinking about? Because that's traditionally what a lot of people will think about, disk drives, storage. I've got to keep this data, I've got to keep it, keep it growing, and that's part of the Hadoop message. If you're going to do an analysis, if you're going to do business intelligence with this, actually what you need to be thinking about is these guys. Everyone seems to forget the humble CPU because this is what does the work. The drives only store it. If these aren't grinding, and by the way, I need more than just a handful of them to do large-scale analytics. Now, Hadoop will take this a long way for you. But I would argue that it's still, because of the underlying disk subsystems, cannot take it to full tilt performance, to literally get every core. Remember, these sort of processors now have 12 core, 16 cores. If you can drive them with 100% effective workload, you can get a lot done. So we end up with this. We end up with the gap between all that storage and all of that power. Of course, that brings us back to our friend put our big memory in there. Of course, the reality is more what we're deploying here in our servers. So all of these sections highlighted in red, as far as I'm concerned, is where the analytical value is. Because that allows you to put the data close to where the work gets done. And just as an aside, a lot of people are touting flash as part of in-memory. Can I just say? That's not the same thing. Digital, you know, silicon-based storage is replacing Rust-based storage is not the same thing as putting data in DRAM. In memory means in DRAM. These things give you a performance boost. You pay a quite a premium for them, but they definitely give you an I.O. boost. But if you boost the I.O. to a system that's not properly driving CPUs, you've just moved the bottleneck. 
So you've, you've chased the problem further up the line, you haven't solved the problem. Let's also talk about cash. Oops, yep, get the wrong words again. Cash, that's what we need to talk about. I hear this word all the time. So you're just caching the data. Well, in memory, could be deemed to be a business cache. I'm holding an amount of information in memory for the business to serve a need. However, cache is not deterministic. Ooh, big word, what does he mean by that? It means that a cache hopes should give you what you want if it's done its job correctly. But I cannot guarantee. And the issue around that means that every time I want to do something with a piece of data or a chunk of data, I actually have to say, oh, do I have it? The difference is, is when I have the data in memory, locked in structures in DRAM, I don't have to do that. I don't have to keep asking that question. So in memory, I think, has been to some degree distorted and a little bit misunderstood as I started with our uh, woolly RAM at the beginning there. So in memory means dynamic, random access memory. That means I can access any byte, excuse me, any element of a data row, any piece of data with one instruction, one call, I can reach it and do something with it and guarantee to get to it. You say, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters when you want to optimize for raw performance. So if I just want to do a simple ripple through data in memory, that is the assembler, which will turn into just a series of very small instructions that a modern CPU will fly through. There isn't a chunk of code here that says, is the data in cache? Because it already knows the data is pinned, locked into memory, in a structure that it can just walk through. And this is the key difference between true in-memory processing and just putting data in RAM. You can take pages of data off the disks, put it in memory, but you're still going to be reshaping. This is about structural approach and optimization and throughput. Let's also talk about scale. There are in-memory solutions. Um, some I can think of, you know, ClickText, I think quite well known in the industry as a departmental tool in memory, but it's only single server. Oracle with Exolytics likes you to believe about in-memory processing. It's okay if it's on a single server. The problem is, is we're coming from an environment, remember we established at the beginning those massive flows and the data lakes volume. So you can't put this on a single server. I know HP are trying to help. They created, what was it, the Kraken with multi-terabyte RAM. We're going backwards again. We're going back to the days of Numa architectures, SMP processing. The problem is, is then you're sharing a memory bus that slows everything down and ultimately you reach a limit. You've got to go scale out. You've got to do massively parallel scale out. You've got to put as many CPUs, as many cores as possible into the problem and keep adding them on a reliable basis as the data grows. And you also get growth in the, the buses, the memory buses. Remember, if you have a single server, those CPUs are all sharing the memory buses you can only squeeze ultimately so much through. If I scale out, I'm adding memory buses to the proposition, which improves, again, my overall throughput and ability to do analytics. And it's funny how some of these sort of older engineering aspects get a little bit forgotten or pushed to one side and forgotten. I love to sort of highlight them with a sort of a quirky term because it, it makes people go away remembering, yeah, he was the guy who put the big red bus up. But yeah, actually, I get the point. We need lots of buses for throughput. Then we get to this challenge, and I imagine there are maybe even some of you in the room, there's certainly people at this conference whose job is to develop optimization or to develop the optimizer for various applications. This is a tough job. Again, you cannot do this on a simplistic basis. Remember, we talked about the SQL development from ANSI 89 on through to 2011. What that essentially amounts to is ever more sophisticated and complex methods which make this itself ever more complex and demanding to build, develop, and deliver the goods on. Because remember, the optimizer's got to make things better. It's got to find the optimal path and method. Again, by locking things down in memory, you can simplify some of that and gain the throughput. So th this kind of optimization code this is sort of midstream in the declaration of an of, of a access method. 
is something that some of the new upstarts in the SQL on Hadoop, I think, have got a few years of engineering, probably even half a decade, I might dare say, of engineering to do before they'll get to the point that some of us have engineered through already. Ah, back to our pile of cash again. Good news is you don't need that big pile of cash to buy large in memory anymore. Big RAM is available in the cloud. Amazon and others can provide you large memory footprint servers. All the hardware manufacturers are more than happy to provide you with large memory footprint servers. And look at this curve. It's very rare that you see a curve that declines like this. And by the way, this is a log curve. Okay? Price of RAM over recent history. It's pretty much collapsed in recent time compared to where it was. The, the line that goes through there is uh, a dollar a megabyte. You can see the point where we transition through that. So this is good news for people like myself who like to talk about in memory, because people in the past used to say, it's going to be expensive. Well, yeah, there's a cost to it, but it's nowhere near what you think it is or was. And then we come back to innovation. Back to our twisty light bulb again. The world of memory isn't standing still. DDR, dynamic RAM, is going into its next phase. DDR4 is already available, being made available. What does this mean? Much higher throughputs. It's faster. Interestingly enough, like the light bulb there, it's considerably more energy efficient. There's some view that if some of the major data centers convert across to DDR4 RAM, the energy savings for this planet as such would make us considerably greener. So I'm sure the manufacturers of this will be selling that very high. But again, it gives us the ability to deliver data even faster to ever more cores as the Intel's AMDs deliver that greater horsepower to us. And what's that horsepower about? Well, it's about trying to dig into the data to find the value to deliver to your demanding users and I argue that the only way you can do this is to let all the cores be driven hard, doing complex work. And remember, we're talking about work that had sophisticated maths, complex optimizations, complex SQL. I'm not talking about the easy stuff. If you're doing the easy stuff, you'll happily deliver it on Hadoop today. I'm sure you've all established that through the sessions you've sat through over the last few days. So as a reminder, in memory, is not about storing data in RAM. It's about putting data close to the CPUs to allow them to do work processing the analytics that you require. And SQL is going to be the primary language that you're going to be doing that work through. You have other options, I have no doubts. And I'm sure you're in the room today trying to make some judgments around this. From my side, from the, the Cognitio side, our view is, is that you can slide an in-memory layer into your existing infrastructure feed from your various source systems. We can directly connect into Hadoop. We can directly connect into cloud data or the traditional data warehouse, draw the data out of those existing persistent platforms on demand into an in-memory layer, and then allow your traditional applications that you've already invested in just to connect through, through the interfaces and with the language and the sophistication of that language they expect. The good news is, is you're serving the Google generation because of the raw performance. Because remember, up there alongside the RAM are the CPUs that are going to do the work for you. Minimally invasive, uses the same kind of tech as your Hadoop. It's the same class of servers, just a bit more RAM, a little less disk, lots of CPUs. So you're not doing anything fundamentally different from what you've done in the past. You're just creating a best of breed analytics platform. For some of your work, for some of your course level ana analysis, of course you'll do that in Hadoop. Hadoop's perfectly suited to that. But remember, I'm talking the low latency, high frequency, high complexity type analysis with high concurrency, remember all these words, that the business demands. So of course, if we come back to Jeff here, he's got it, you know, he's, he's on, his, on his way, he's got the ability to acquire the data build his structure and plan, deliver through his standard tools he's already invested in. He might make selections for some of the newer tools coming through. And he can do it through the standard interfaces without disruption to the business. So he should be feeling a little bit more comfortable. 
I love this old word because it used to be on TV programs I used to see as a kid. You used to watch the program and at the end there'd be the epilogue. So let's that, just think forward a little bit. Just, this is just me having a little play here. So where might we be with all of this in a few years' time? Well, this stuff is going to become commoditized. What do I mean by this stuff? The Hadoop, the infrastructure. Consider this, that anything to do with storage ultimately becomes commoditized. What do I mean by commoditized? Well, ultimately, it's going to disappear into the hardware. The hardware manufacturers will just embed this stuff. And you say, well, that's, no, nah, that's not going to happen. Well, it's already happening. Okay, Seagate have launched a new generation of storage devices. It's essentially a disk drive with an Ethernet interface and the ability to do key pair lookups directly from an array of those. So there's no server involved. It's just a bunch of Ethernet connected disks. And you can buy that today. And it's already offering functional capability. So let's think a couple of years forward. What's stopping it from offering direct HDFS file system on those Ethernet-connected storage devices. Take a little step further, what stops the MapReduce frameworks, Yarn, etc., from going to firmware on those devices? You think back, you think about the pro progression of hardware and technology out there and how it's proceeded onwards. So I set that as a challenge. Because again, it brings us back to this. Ultimately, all this excitement that we've seen at the event will change, it will consolidate. Some of the big vendors will force the consolidation. Your purchasing behaviors and implementation behaviors will ultimately drive that consolidation. Anyway, keeping to the time schedule today, I think I'm pretty much on time. As I said, Paul Groom from Cognitio. I'll happily take any questions from the floor up until the point they throw me out. So thank you. <laughs>